I'm going to give today is a brief history of the BSD fast file system. This work actually all started back in the late 70s, and that fast file system actually started being deployed in about 1982. So if you were to do the math, that's like 30 and something years ago. If you had asked me at the time if I thought that this software was still going to be being used, 30-something years later, I would have wondered what version of ACID you had just dropped. Nevertheless, it still does, in fact, seem to be here. And uh, one of the, the things that I'm actually fairly proud of is the fact that uh, someone found a disk image from 1982, and I was able to bring it up, put it on, and, and, and mount it um, with the current version of the file system and it was able to read and write that file system. Uh, it did fail one of the FSCK checks because it no longer is maintaining the rotational layout uh, calculations. But other than that, uh, it was completely fine. So let's start at the beginning, which would be 1979. And this is really the early file system work uh, that was being done up until that point. Uh, we didn't really have this notion of recoverability. So if the, uh, if, if the system crashed at an inopportune time, somebody had to go in manually, somebody like a person, and run things like I-check and N-check and D-check and patch things in the file system to get it back to working. Uh, this was later replaced by FSCK, but the FSCK still couldn't fix everything. Sometimes it required manual intervention. So the first thing that got done was staging modifications so that the file system was always recoverable by FSCK. The other bit of work that we did at the time was to try and see if we could improve the performance. Uh, at the, the file system of that era just kept all the free blocks on a linked list. And so as blocks were free, they were put onto the front of the list, and they were used as they were needed. They were taken off. And one of the disk vendors described it as the thin film effect, the sort of the three blocks floated to the surface and drifted around. And so you would end up with layouts where the file required seeking all over the disk. And given the size of disk platters, a seek was a big operation. Uh, so we tried changing the block size from 512 to 1K byte. And we went from being able to utilize 3 to 5% of the disk bandwidth all the way to 4 to 8 percent of the disk bandwidth. Uh, the performance doubled because we had half as many blocks to transfer for any given file size. And it, they were still horribly laid out, but at least there were only half as many to run around and pick up. Uh, and hence, the performance nearly doubled. So this gave us the idea that bigger blocks was going to help uh, going forward. Uh, and so that, that led then to the design of the fast file system. Uh, here we decided we would use a hybrid block size, uh, so you could have big blocks for big files. Uh, but in order to not waste too much space, uh, we would be able to take one of these big blocks and break it up into up to eight pieces. Uh, so we could take a 4K block and we'd make the files a bunch of 4K blocks, and then we could have a, a little fragment that'd be 512 or 1K or one and a half K or whatever. And so we would get the density of the original 512K or 512 byte block file system, but most files would transfer much faster because of the big blocks. And the other uh, issue is uh, that we used bitmaps to describe the, uh, where the free blocks were. So now instead of just getting any random layout, we could look around where you were currently allocating and find something nearby so that we could keep things much more compact. So if none of this was rocket science, but for the time, it took us from being able to use just a small percentage of the disk bandwidth up to 50%. Uh, we could only get to 50% because we still, uh, we couldn't chain together I.O. operations at that time. Okay, so we had, to, we had to leave at least one free block after every block that we allocated. And as I said, it's still in use today. Um, in 1987, we went off and, and did this sort of weird stuff with file system stacking. Uh, and the idea here is that you just have these sort of layers that you put on top of each other, uh, rather than trying to integrate them all into a single big glob. Uh, so here we see uh, the fast file system 
uh, sitting at the bottom, and then we could put an NFS server on that, uh, and then export that locally to places that were using the same passwording root files, or we could export it through a, a thing that would remap UIDs and GIDs for some other uh, system configuration. And the point is that the UID GID mapping is not part of this, it's a separate module and you only pay for it if you need it and so on and so forth. Anyway, requests work their way down through the stack until you get to some place that wants to handle it and if it gets all the way to the bottom then you just get operation not supported. So there's all kinds of things, the loop back file system and the union file system and other things uh, that got developed in that time period. By 1988, the disks were starting to get bigger and so we changed the default block size to be 8K blocks with 1K fragments. This now means that we waste some space because the minimum size is two disk sectors, but unsurprisingly it nearly doubled the throughput uh, and we only wasted a small percentage of the, the disk space. You'll see this as a recurring theme. Note that we could still run and still today can run 4K 512 file systems if you want to. Uh, this is just what the default was if you didn't change it to something else. And in 1990, we came up with this concept of dynamic block reallocation. And the, the issue here is that there's this struggle that you have with trying to decide where to lay things out on the disk. So when someone opens a file and starts writing to it, you have no idea how big it's going to ultimately be. It may just be small, it might end up being some huge video file or something else in between. So you have to say, well, where should I lay out the blocks for this file? If it's going to be small, then I should put it someplace where I just have a small amount of space left on the disk. But if it's going to be big, I should put it in this nice big continuous area. Well, since it, every file might get big, maybe I should just always put it in the big continuous area. But after a while, you don't have any big continuous areas because it's all been broken up into little pieces from all the small files that got put there. So the idea of dynamic block reallocation is that you start out assuming the files are going to be small. So they write the first block. And you find some place that you have exactly one free block, and you put it there. And then they write another block, and you go, huh. Well. Instead of putting it there, actually, I'm going to put it over here where I have two free blocks, three free blocks, four free blocks. And after a while, it's like, oh, this really is a big file, and now I move it over to where it's contiguous. Now, this sounds like we do a lot of reading and writing, and in fact, if the file is growing slowly, you do a lot of reading and writing. But normally, it grows pretty quickly, and so all we end up doing is renumbering where it's ultimately going to be sent to the disk while it's still sitting in the buffer cache. And so, you know, by the time we write it, We've figured out that it's big, and so it's just a, its first time it lands on disk, it's out in the big area. So what this means is now the big areas get used for big files. So when you delete a big file, you get a big area back again, uh, and the small files end up using the, the small bits of space. So uh, the the upshot of this is you say, all right, well, you know, how much does this really help? Uh, and the answer is that you really have to look at a file system over a period of time. A lot of benchmarks, you create a file system and you run your benchmark on this you know, brand new file system. Of course, everything's going to be laid out nicely. There's nothing but nice space to use. What's interesting is how well it's still laying out six months from now, or a year from now, or two years from now, uh, as the things think get more fragmented from lots of files being created and deleted and so on. And so how do you measure that? So the upshot of this was that some folks at Harvard created these traces from their, some of their server machines, which recorded every, the, the size of every file uh, and when it was created and when those files were deleted. So they had a three-year trace that you could just play back and age a file system for three years over, at those days, it took about two days to run it. Uh, but you could see what it would look like after three years, at least, of their type of operations. And what you find is with most file systems, they start out, of course, great. And it, then the, the, it sort of falls off and falls off. And it usually stabilizes at about 60, 55 to 60% of the throughput that you got when it was brand new. And with dynamic block reallocation, instead, that flattens out at about 85%. So it's a significant improvement for very little amount of work. Uh, I wrote papers about it and flogged it and tried to get other file systems to put it in place. And to this day, pretty much not done. I don't know why. 
Okay, so by the mid-90s, we were doing pretty well on big files. We, had, we were getting 90% uh, of the throughput of the disk pretty much uh, most of the time. Uh, and so the real issue started turning to how well you could do, deal with small file behavior. And small file behavior becomes interesting because of a lot of stuff with serving up web files and spooling things like uh, email and other things, which are mostly small files that you have to be careful with, at least with the, the email files, you're doing a lot of half syncs and so on. And the, the, the creation and deletion of files had been done up to that point by just doing synchronous writes. Two synchronous writes pretty much for every allocation or freeing. And that is really slow. You can only do about 50 to 100 file creations or deletions per second. And that's not going to cut it on a big server. So lots of different approaches got used, logging and journaling and other things. But uh, what we chose to do was something called soft updates. And the, the business with soft updates is it stages the I.O. operations such that the, the disk is always consistent. It's behind the in-core state by up to two minutes, uh, but it's always consistent. And of course, with F-Syncs, you, you don't have to wait two minutes. So it'll get what you need on disk uh, quickly and permanently. OK, so the, uh, it, it, soft updates minimizes the amount of soft uh, synchronous disk I.O. Uh, and other than the fact that it can lose blocks, uh, what the, the, the bitmaps don't stay completely consistent, but the only errors in them are that they think that things are being used that are in fact free. So you do periodically, after enough crashes, need to run an FFCK-like tool to find all of the things that you've lost and put them back in the bitmaps. In order to do that, you had to write a real-time garbage collector, and I looked around at doing that, and said, that's too hard. I don't want to do that. And you know, writing out SCK was bad enough. I just want to run out SCK. Well, SCK requires the system to be offline in order to do it. And it can take a long time if it's a large file system. So I said, well, we'll just put in snapshots. So we can take a snapshot of the file system. And then we can just point out SCK at that because it's not changing. And it doesn't matter how long it takes because it's looking for stuff that's lost. So you know, if it takes it three hours to find everything that's lost, uh, it doesn't matter because it's still going to be lost three hours later. Uh, and so it finds this set of things that are lost. And then we added a set of system calls to say, all right, these, these blocks should be marked free. And it does it under the locks that you would normally have. So it can be done on a live file system. And then suddenly, boom, all this free space shows up. OK, well. That's nice and all, but you know, it still requires that you run FSCK, which consumes a lot of resources in your system. So we'll get back to how we deal with that. Meanwhile, 2001 rolls around, and it's time to raise the block size again. Uh, this time, we went to 16K blocks with 2K fragments. Uh, again, doubled the throughput, but uh, wasted a bit more space. Uh, Background FSCK this is the thing that I just talked about uh, to recover the space. Then by 2003, uh, we decided that um, you know this file system is kind of running out of steam. Um, when I did the original version of the, uh, the fast file system, we moved from a file system that had 24-bit block pointers up to 32-bit block pointers. And Bill Joy, who was running the project at the time, was sort of appalled that I was you know, wasting all this space by having 32-bit block pointers and explained to me that you know, based on physics, disks could never get bigger than some particular size that wouldn't need 32-bit block pointers. I don't know if physics changed or you know, quite what happened. But anyway, they seemed to be delivering these things. And uh, we were running out of steam. We couldn't really go past about a four terabyte file system because then it just had too many blocks. So the time came to uh, go and increased the size of block pointers to 64 bits. And uh, we considered just doing a whole new file system, but it seemed a lot easier just to sort of do a rattle on the existing file system, because that allowed us to reuse most of the code. Things like rename, which are horrendous to write, but aren't going to change based on the block size. So uh, we just went through and pretty much used the same code base. There's about 10 functions that have 
clone of each other. So one is for the 32 bits and the other is for the 64 bit. Uh, the rest of it is just reused uh, unchanged. One of the things that I, in retrospect, wished I'd also done is change the inode from 32 number from 32 to 64 bits, but that would have affected a great deal more stuff. And somehow I just thought that four billion files was enough in a file system. Little did I know. Okay. Uh, also, in that time frame, uh, extended attributes uh, started becoming a bigger deal. We wanted to have the ability to add access control lists. We wanted the ability to add mandatory access control labels and other things. And rather than try and just reserve some space in the inode or have an auxiliary file as we had done to, in our first implementation of ACLs, we decided to integrate the extended attributes into the, the inode itself. So it has a separate set of pointers so it's a, essentially a, almost like a second file, file fork in the Mac terms, where you can store these other things. And uh, they're done, the, the format of them is uh, essentially a linked list of things. So there's a pointer to where the next one begins, and a type, and then whatever that thing is. And so you can just go through and look at the type, and if you understand it, you interpret it, and if you don't, you just add the length and go on to the next one. So some things are labeled as system, uh, those will be ACLs and Macs, and only the system can change them. Other are user, and that can be whatever you want it to be, little pictures or you know, whatever. Okay, so the extended attributes then got added actually when we did the rev to go to the 64 bits. Uh, the benefit of also having it in the same inode is that they update atomically with fsync. So when you fsync the file, the contents of the file and the attributes all get synced in, in one go. So this then gave us the ability to do the full access control lists. Uh, these are the things that allow you to have a specific list of users and groups that can access the file. Uh, so instead of just being the owner, the group, and everybody else, now it's arbitrary list of users, each of which can have read permission and write permission, execute permission, uh, system administration, which means they're allowed to change attributes. and. Uh, various and sundry other bits and pieces. So it's a much more grandiose thing that you can do and much finer grain of control. And uh, again, we can atomically update those things because the extended attributes update atomically. So ACLs, access control lists, are things that can be changed by the user. So they are discretionary access control. That is, each user gets to decide how the, their files are going to be accessed and, and access them and so on. Mandatory access controls are things that are imposed on the system from above. So the system administrator makes decisions about mandatory access controls. And even if it's your file, if the, the administrator has decided some rule about what, who can access this file, you can't change that. Uh, so this is, allows you to impose rules like, you know, this file is secret and this other one is top secret, so you can con copy the contents from secret to top secret, but you can't copy contents from top secret back down to secret, even if you own both of the files yourself. Uh, the point is that it, 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 it's a different mechanism uh, that, that allows control over the system as a whole. Okay, uh, what's actually in there is a framework, and so they're just all sprinkled through the kernel any place where there's some decision that potentially needs to be made. There's a call into the Mac framework. There's a listing in one of the header files of all the different sort of privilege type things that are being asked for. And then you, to create an, one of these mandatory access frameworks, you just go in and, and, for example, can say, all right, you know, these things you can do and these other things you can't. Uh, so the, the, the Mac framework is uh, potentially useful for uh, con controlling access in uh, capsicum related things or in jail related things or other frameworks that you may want to impose that are controlling the way the system can be used. 
many of you were around the FreeBSD project as symmetric multiprocessing got pushed through. This was a very huge and very painful process. Uh, and uh, so started as usual with a giant lock around the kernel. It's sort of like one CPU can run the kernel and all the other CPUs can't uh, effectively. Uh, so that works sort of up to n equals 2 because sort of about half the time seems to be spent in the kernel. Uh, so as soon as you've got past two CPUs, the giant lock didn't work very well. And so what ended up happening on sort of a system call by system call basis, these, the giant lock got replaced with finer grain locking. So 2004, the vNode interface got fine grain locking. 2005, the disk subsystem got it. And then finally in 2006, it got pushed through the fast file system and we had a path that was uh, multi-threaded all the way through the system. For the file system. All right, well, remember we had that background FSCK thing uh, to clean up after a while. And uh, as files, these file systems kept getting bigger and bigger, uh, it became more and more painful to run background FSCK. And so uh, it, it was actually at VSD CAN with Jeff Robinson was there. And he said, well, you know, you could just like journal the couple things that uh, you know have to do with updating the bitmaps, and then you wouldn't have to run FSCK. You could just roll back the journal, and it would tell you where the things were you needed to put away. You know how hard could it be that back of the envelope calculation, blah blah blah. And so we sort of went back and forth and back and forth during the course of the week talking about it, and uh, so uh, you know came up with sort of sketched out how it ought to be done. And it became clear to me that this was like not just going to be like you know a little thousand line thing that was going to be added. Um, it was going to more or less double the size of the soft updates code. Um, and I was got sort of cold feet on this, but Jeff was all excited, and so he just started coding it up and sending me stuff. And in the course of about six months, uh, it got done. So at any rate, uh, the idea is we're only going to journal the things that uh, orphan resources. So the journal actually only needs to be about 16 megabytes, and that's independent of the file system size. Really, the size of the journal is how uh, often you do the, the journal checkpoints. And uh, you know, it starts to get too full, you just do a checkpoint. In fact, when we went to try and make sure that the code that uh, deals with the fact that there's no space in the journal worked properly, despite our best efforts, we had to cut the journal size down to about half a megabyte before we could finally trigger that code running. Uh, at any rate, what, what is it you actually need to do? Well, when you do free operation in the, in the bitmaps, you need to have a journal entry that basically says these blocks are being freed. Um, and then when they actually get written, the, the updated bitmaps get written to disk, then you can mark off that that's been done. So in fact, you just, when you're running through the journal, uh, you essentially can just check and see if everything got done and anything that didn't get done, you do it. Uh, for the inodes, you got to track link count changes because when the link count goes to zero, obviously the inode is going to be freed, but it takes a while now for that to trickle uh, its way through the system. Uh, the other thing that's really nasty to deal with is unlink while referenced. So a lot of uh, one of the very interesting, interesting, bizarre semantics of Unix is you can create and open a file and uh, then delete the file, and as long as you keep the file descriptor open, the file's still there. And a lot of daemons do this. They create some scratch file in slash temp, and then they just unlink it so that when they get shut down and that file descriptor closes, the file will go away. But it'll stay there for days and days and days and days. Uh, and you know, if the system crashes, well, of course, it's still going to that file's still going to be there, and now FSCK would have to go find this unlinked file. So we have to keep track of these files that are open but unlinked. And it turns out you have to do this with a linked list that has a header in the super block and goes through, links through all the inodes that are the on disk version of the inodes of these files. And maintaining this linked list in a way that's consistent turns out to be challenging. All right. At any rate, that got done, and so now uh, after a crash, you just run through the journal, and it takes usually less than a second to bring the file system to a clean state, and then you're where you go. 
All right. Well, in 2011, it was yet again time to raise the block size. Uh, this time, we were driven by the fact that the disk vendors had finally realized that maybe 512 byte sectors were kind of tiny uh, and that 4K would actually be better. Uh, in fact, in doing that, they almost doubled the capacity of their disks overnight. Because it turns out that errors in disks come in bursts. And so, the, but those bursts are fairly rare. So you need enough, essentially, redundancy CRC uh, bits to be able to deal with these runs of errors. And uh, so the, the, the amount of space you need for, uh, for each sector uh, is some large chunk that's on the order of around 400 bits or 400 uh, bytes. So when you have 512 byte sectors, the overhead of that thing is huge. But when you go to 4K sectors, you still only need only slightly more bits than that. So they bought back just a huge amount of space, uh, and and so you know just by having fewer CRC bits, uh, they doubled the capacity of their disk. So. 4K became the new standard. You, these disks still will tell you that they'll do 512, but don't think you should do that because the only way they do that is to read in 4K, change that, and then write it back. And of course, they've just missed it, so now you have to wait for another whole rotation to come around before they can write back the modified bits. So the, uh, the upshot is that you really don't want to use less than 4K. So if you don't want to use less than 4K, well, then the obvious thing to do is go to 32K, 4K. And we can say small files, once again, go to using a minimum of one disk sector, so it makes us look good in terms of our wasted space. And in 2013, I was at a, the USENIX FAST conference. This is the File and Storage Technology Conference. And uh, it's sort of like all file system talks all day long for three days. It's great. Uh, Either great or awful, depending on your view. But since I can't imagine anything other than file systems being interesting, you know, what else would you want to go to? All right. Anyway, um, the, uh, the they had this paper about this thing that they had done in Linux, where they uh, they, they they have something that's similar to what we call a cylinder group. Cylinder group is from the old days where you had a set of cylinders on the disk that uh, were next to each other, so they were short seeks to get around. We still use the name cylinder group, but it's really just that we break the disk up into these sets of, of uh, blocks. At any rate, uh, they're, they're, they would res reserve um, the first 4% of each of their cylinder group equivalents to hold metadata. And so the idea here is that if you've got all the inodes, we already have the inodes there, now we're going to have all the indirect blocks there and all the directory contents there. Uh, and their main goal was to make FSCK run faster, so they could essentially, FSCK would come in there, uh, it doesn't need to look at the data blocks, it can just get all the metadata it needs very locally, zip over, get all the next set of things it needs locally, and so it made that run a lot faster. It makes random access to files run faster because you have all of the indirect blocks are all in one place. In fact, they're usually all on one track, and so they drop into the track cache when you first touch them, and then you, everything's just really quick, quick, quick. So it uh, seemed like a great idea. Uh, they, they did their implementation, of course, in Linux. Uh, and they had to make several thousand lines of change. They had to change the on-disk format of the file system to make this thing work. Um, and you know, so the chances that it'll see the light of day that, that you know, Linux will change ext3 or ext4 on-disk format for this is unlikely. But the way that the fast file system is designed is that it's divided into the implementation and the policy routine. And the implementation you get right once. I got that right in 1982, and don't touch it, because that's the thing that keeps you from curdling a file system. You can play around with any kind of policy you want, no matter how awful the policy is, you cannot mess up the disk. Because the policy is everything should be on sector one. Well. The other code will just keep sort of pushing things out. I mean, you've got a lousy layout, but it'll never double allocate. Because if you ask for something unreasonable, it'll just find something that's OK. So actually, in the lunch break, after hearing this paper, so in about 90 minutes, I just coded up, reserving the first 4% of, the, of the, each cylinder group uh, for metadata. And it's about 100 lines of code. And uh, 
it's discretionary. So if you, you know you run out of space there, then you just fall. You know, the metadata goes out in the regular data area, and if the data area runs out, it can use this area. Uh, so, so it's all sort of loosey goosey, but it, it you know pretty much works the way you want most of the time in most of the cylinder groups. Uh, and so the uh, the upshot is that uh, you know, the, the, when you do things like file, file tree traversal where you're walking down a tree, and again, all the directories are right there in one place, so it goes really fast. Random access goes fast. Uh, the, the, even the sequential access goes quickly because all your metadata is usually in one track. Uh, it speeds up SCK for obvious reasons. Uh, and the key is that the metadata is advisory. The, one, the thing that caught them off on the wrong foot is because they required it, all the metadata to be in that area. And so if they ran out, they had all this other stuff they had to worry about. Uh, whereas I, I just don't care if you run out, you know, big deal, it's, but it's spill over into the other area. So, uh, and it's, since it's handled on a per cylinder group basis, you know, a few cylinder groups will spill, but most of them won't. And so I put this in, and it, it really does make you know, a dramatic difference, especially with a lot of small stuff or tree walks or other things of that sort. And FSCK runs faster enough than anybody cares anymore. Okay, so one of the things you should sort of notice from this is that it seems like every couple of years something has to happen. Uh, so, you know, Steve Bourne was talking about how, you know, he did the shell and then he went off and did other things. Well, you know, I did the file system and I thought I was done with that. And so then I started working on the VM system and I thought I was done with that and I started working on NFS. and then. People kept coming back and saying, well, what about this and what about that? And pretty soon I realized I was in way over my head. Uh, luckily, I've managed to get rid of NFS in the VM system. So now all I have to worry about in my life is the file system. Uh, so, you know, there's, what are the future directions? Well, the first question that people ask is, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's this new thing called ZFS. You know, in FreeBSD, uh, you know, it's got a lot more functionality than UFS does. So, you know, why are you even worrying about these things? Um, the answer is that ZFS and UFS really fill two completely different niches. ZFS deals with ginormous file systems that I wouldn't dare put under UFS because if you ever had to run FSCK on it, you know, your, you know one of your grandkids would probably have to be around for when FSCK finished. Uh, and if you need snapshots, I mean, it has them, but they're slow and they're painful, and you know, ZFS just does those like you know, in its sleep. Uh, and it's got a lot of redundancy and other things that are fantastic. But it is a very, very resource intensive file system. You've got to have a 64 bit processor. Uh, you have got to have at least 20 gigabytes of memory, and 100 is better, and 200 is even better. Uh, you need a lot of disk, you need a lot of stuff to make that work. And it, what you're trying to build is a file server that is exactly the right way to use those kind of resources. On the other hand, if you want to run on a little BeagleBone Black or a little tiny embedded system, you really don't want ZFS on that box. You need something that's lean and mean and fast. The UFS will run circles around the, the performance of reading and writing in ZFS because it's not doing checksumming and redundancy and RAID and all these other things that ZFS has in it. So if all you need is getting data on and off the disk fast, UFS is going to continue to be what you want to use. It's, you know, Netflix has these boxes out in the field, and they need UFS. They do not need ZFS on those boxes because they need it to be very highly performing. Uh, and so, you know, and they don't care. You know, if the disk dies, they just you know put in a new disk and download the same material onto it. Um, so, they, they don't need the reliability and they do need the speed. So there's going to continue to be a place for both of these file systems for the foreseeable future. OK, so in that case, what am I going to do in the future? Well, uh, there's trim requests. So if you've got an underlying media uh, read flash that wants to know when blocks aren't being used anymore, you send what's called a trim request down to the disk to let it know that. And at the moment, what happens is as every block is freed, we send a trim request down. And you get this huge stream of trim requests, and it overwhelms the drive. And so what we do better is to sort of aggregate them and say, you know, this giant piece is now all being released instead of sending it down one at a time. Uh, at the moment, you can either have journaled soft updates or you can have snapshots. Uh, 
And the reason is because the, the journaling doesn't know how to keep the snapshots uh, correct. And every time you free a block, you need to ask each snapshot if it wants it. Uh, and you can't actually free it until there's no snapshot that wants it. So uh, the journaling doesn't know how to deal with that. Uh, so either uh, we need to uh, take the code that does that out of the kernel and put it into the thing that does the journaling, roll back, or we need to just say after crash all snapshots get deleted because they probably won't be correct after a crash. We haven't done either of those. It, there used to be, oh, we got it, snapshots working. Now my attitude is, look, if you need snapshots, go use ZFS because it just does them so much better. Okay, the last thing that we have plaguing us, as far as I'm concerned, are these things called SMR, Shingled Magnetic Recording Disk Drives. They are kind of like flash in the sense that uh, you have to, you, you can only write once and you have to write you know, continuously uh, all the way through the, the, these big four, what is it? I think it's four megabyte chunks. Uh, and then if you want to rewrite that, you essentially have to start all over. You have to throw the entire four megabytes away and then start over from the beginning. Uh, so you can, you, you, you get sort of, you have to treat them as if you were trying to deal with the raw flash. So one way to do that would be to take the things that need to be sort of updated over and over, like the bitmaps and the inodes, um, and put them into the area of the SMR drive that allows the traditional behavior. They give you a little bit of the drive, which you can just sort of randomly read and write, and then use the, the part that you can't do for just the data blocks, especially the, for the large files. And then you can stage the soft update completions uh, to batch things together so that they would be written in an order, uh, which would keep the SMR drive happy. At this point, SMR drives only buy you about 20% more capacity, and so it doesn't really seem like it's worth jumping through all the hoops. But when I was at the FAST conference this year, they're talking about, oh, well, you know, they're going to get better. We're going to get, you know, almost double the capacity in the next five years or whatever. Um, we'll see. I I'm, I'm remain unconvinced, but, you know, at least I have some strategy if it comes down to needing to deal with those things. Okay, so that's what I have to say. Any questions? What uh, what compromises are still left in UFS for spinning disks that you could, or put it another way, is there anything that you can do to optimize UFS for SSDs? So the the question for the people on the video is: Is there anything that could be done in UFS to optimize it for flash, basically? Uh, it's pretty much the same things that you would want to do for these shingled magnetic recording disks, uh, in the sense that uh, at least trying to get the stuff where you're, you're writing sort of big contiguous pieces uh, separate from the stuff where you're writing little bitty bits. Uh, we kind of do that now um, because of moving all the metadata to the front of the cylinder group. So we have sort of areas. Uh, and for flash, you know, there's no area that, that's easy to, to, to randomly read and write. Um, but uh, the, the fact that we compact that means that the other things are being done sort of closer to what they want. So really just staging it so that we would write it you know, continuously rather than sort of you know, somewhat randomly, because flash doesn't like that randomness. Uh, Really, if you want to have a file system that's going to work on Flash, you really sort of want to rethink the way you do it. Uh, you probably want to move more towards a non-overrating file system, so a ZFS mod style of writing. So ZFS never overwrites something once it's written it uh, until, well, eventually it goes back and reclaims empty space, and then it will overwrite it. But uh, generally speaking, it just works its way through uh, and doesn't go back and, and write, overwrite inodes or directories or anything of that sort. So uh, probably that would be a better approach to trying to deal with raw flash than to try and take the traditional overwriting file system and somehow make that work better. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much.